Good morning. My name is uh, Jens Henrik uh, Neunkirchen, and I've been asked to uh, uh, say something about uh, services standardization, and I call the presentation Status and Challenges. And I have to say that this presentation is kind of uh, based on my personal views as a um, Statol employee, being part of the subsea community uh, within Statol for almost 30 years, and also based on the fact that I'm convener in for Workgroup 6, ISO, being responsible for all the subsea equipment standards. Ah, oh, there it comes. And uh, the, the, the plan for this presentation is to, as indicated on, on, um, on the screen, starting with giving a status. First step is a status in a historic perspective. Then I'll cover status as per today. I'll outline a little bit about uh, challenges cover statal strategy related to standardization. Way forward with a question mark indicates it's a bit iffy. And if there is time, I'll cover a little bit about the ISO legal issues, is what I call it. But first, put this into an historic perspective. In the early 90s, in statal, we started developing what we called subsea specifications. And we actually were able to produce quite a few of them. But at that time, this Norsok initiative came along. And it was decided that our specifications should be put on the table to, uh, to, to, to be part of, of the Norsok standards. And we were working very closely together with Norsk Hydro and Saga. And we were able to produce quite a few NORSOC standards. And we were very proud of that initiative, bringing kind of the element of being uh, company driven into kind of national driven. So it was a good step in the right direction. At the same time, this ISO international standardization came on the table. And we decided to, to, uh, to join forces and, 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 and be part of, of, uh, of developing national standards into international standards. And we put our NORSOC standards on the table as a starting point for ISO subsea standards. More or less in parallel with this, it was an initiative between ISO at a high level and API at a high level to see if ISO and API, and I'm talking within subsea environment now, to join forces. And that was, as I said, uh, driven from, from the top and um, so, so in, uh, and, and, and that was a starting point for kind of trying to make similar standards, API and ISO. Only difference should be the front page. Or in the US, API front page, rest of the world, ISO. And as uh, indicated here, we had a good uh, cooperation between API and ISO. We were working as one family almost for, for, for uh, yeah, 15, more than 15 years. And this cooperation that's um, achieved a co-branding co of standards so that within the subsea, uh, so, uh, related to subsea equipment, we had similar standards, whether you referred to API or ISO. So it was a good step, in, or it is a good step, related to industrialization. And it's important thing is this cooperation and ensured also that within subgroups we were above critical mass because where we were, uh, we were where we had limited resources in Europe, they had resources in US and vice versa. So together we were able to to uh, to produce good standards for most of the uh, subsystems within, within uh, the subsea portfolio. And it's 
the last thing here is also very uh, uh, important, I think, that this uh, uh, cooperation and uh, sure I'm saying equal ground between North Sea experience and Gulf of Mexico, uh, Gulf of Mexico experience, because we had it was basically practically ISO was to a large extent North Sea, API to a large extent US. And when ISO came in with North Sea experience, it was ISO talking to API, which ensured that North Sea kind of applications were taken seriously into consideration. And can give a little bit, th this is, um, as uh, indicated here, it's, um, it's a stat status list from 2010. And uh, as you see, uh, Last, uh, see here, it's the API number and it's the ISO number. Here it's the API uh, project leader and it's the ISO project leader. And I want to, 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 to bring this uh, ISO project leader contact into attention at the far right. You can see here, same as API contact in most of those, for most of those standards. It indicates that the critical mass for most of the standards is US-based. And that's the purpose we're, we're showing this, uh, showing this, uh, this uh, schematic. The next one, more or less uh, the same here. So that's, uh, that's the picture from 2010, showing that we were working together. Only difference was uh, front page, but still the majority of the project leaders were US, and they had a role both as an API project leader and an ISO project leader. And if you go further into this uh, ISO project leader, you will see that most of the ISO project leaders were either from Statoil or FMC in Norway. So that, that's a background, it's a historic part of it. What's the status today? Today, it's no formal cooperation between API and ISO. That's a fact. Most ISO workgroups are below critical mass, as indicated in the last two, two slides from 2010. It's full stop within ISO for more than, been for more than two years due to legal issues. I'll hope I can have time to come a little bit back to that. And it's very high activity within API. This is um, similar to the one I presented from 2010. This is from last summer. It's a status matrix uh, from API. That's still kind of a column with, um, with uh, ISO, I think, in here. But it's showing what's going on in API. The, the yellow indication here, that's standard with continuous working. So it sees, you, you see here from, from this slide, that it's, uh, most of the standards are, there's an active project leader, it's uh, working, it's doing progress. Yeah, and he here is the full picture. And there are, and you can also see that on this slide here, there are more kind of standards or, or, or um, recommended practices, I just call it a standard, than on the 2010. This indicates kind of that there are, uh, for, for new sub, uh, subjects, there are coming up new kind of standards within the IPA community. Challenges. Seen from ISO, we are still challenged by the embargo. So the, the one of the reasons here for 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 uh, full stop in in in, uh, in ISO is related to I can be very uh, quick on this. ISO is a non-political organization. Iran is a member of ISO. There are some embargo issues related to Iran, and that's part of the reason why there is full stop on uh, in, in ISO. But I'd hopefully, I can come a little bit back to this. From an ISO uh, perspective, motivation has eroded amongst doers within the ISO family. And by doers, I mean the people who really write the standards, not the leaders uh, traveling around the world uh, doing meetings, but the doers. And the way I see this being a convener in Workgroup 6, I see we are a production 
uh, facility we are producing standards. That's, that's our main task. API develops new standards, well known progress in ISO. It means that we see different international standards. We haven't similar standards anymore, and it's counterproductive related to industrialization. And it's also more difficult now to promote North Sea experiences, because now it's not ISO talking to API. It's a statal employee or an FMC employee or an other employee being part of many employees within the API environment. This is um, a slide I borrowed from Olaf Inderberg. I think it's good indication on, on the status within the uh, standardization environment. I'm sure glad the hole isn't in our end here. Is saying, and it's, it's an indication of one of the main challenges we have. We are producing standards generally, uh, giving a sub tasks, but a big challenge is to get a holistic perspective on things. There are uh, elements where one requirement in one standard contradicts the requirement in another one. So a large, a big, really big challenge is how do we get this total system approach into kind of international standardization. It's a really big challenge. Now I'd like to cover a little bit about uh, statal uh, strategy. Our uh, task now, based on, 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 on the facts uh, I presented, is that we'd like to increase our activity within the API environment, because that's where things are happening, so it's logical. And we have large investments in, in US and, by, and we want to, to use local, see if we can use local employees trying to promote North Sea experiences to a larger extent than what we have happened to, to do the last two years. Uh, we would like to include critical issues that are not accepted within IPA into NORSOC U001. But last but not least, we'd like to contribute to find a good permanent solution with respect to ISO API. And the first slide indicating that it can be very, very difficult to, to revitalize ISO without uh, API due to lack of, 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 of resources. It's an extremely important point. But we are doing more in Statel than just uh, working with API and ISO. We are, uh, as I speak, we have four pre-feed contracts with, with four main uh, potential subsea suppliers where we, uh, we are, where we are developing what we call subsea standard catalog. It's a subsea system, uh, special built for Nor uh, Norwegian continental shelf applications. And um, this slide here is more or less a design basis uh, for that task, design life 25 years. 80 to 500 meter water depth, uh, max 690 uh, shut-in pressure, and minus 18 to 121 flowing temperature, and max 12 wells per umbilical. So, so th this is an attempt to, to developing a, a kind of a product standard then. And uh, was, uh, which also was indicated by uh, Björn here, uh, it's something we called a configurable standard, because we need to, the ultimate standardization is, of course, to try to standards on, on, on reservoirs, but modern nature isn't standardized. That's the reason why we have to be elements of, 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 of confi configurabil configurability in, in a standard. And for this, uh, our standard here, it shall be fit for everything from oil production to water injection, but it's based on building blocks, and some of these building blocks are configurable. We are also supporting it's also mentioned by, by Björn, an uh, initiative from Norsk Olje and Gas, and a colleague of mine will present that in further detail later, so I'll just skip that, but it just showing us as an indication of that what, what we're doing within the subsea community in Statel related to, to, to standardization. No way forward. We need at least to contribute to industrialization, and that has been mentioned also earlier. And that's a buzzword, and a lot of people talking about industrialization. But I think it's important to the next kind of statement here, 
there are no standard product today. It's a little bit contradiction to the standard catalog, but it's meant as a, generally speaking, the subsea industry uh, is better kind of characterized by tailor-made systems than industrialized systems. I think that is a fact which is underestimated from, uh, from, from uh, uh, a lot of people. If we are seeking, high, uh, seeking um, low price and predictable quality, we need high volume. That's a general statement. It's a fact. That's a fact based on history from other industries. We need high volume and, and, and uh, to, to, to really get a predictable quality and low price. And Company standardization cannot generally give high enough volume. It's a good and right decision for Statoil to develop the standard catalog. Yes, it is. But it doesn't give volumes high enough to create industrialization and get the benefit of, 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 of standardization, as we have seen in the computer industry, car industry, and so on and so forth. So what we need is that operators, the way I see it at least, and suppliers need to cooperate to form industrialized products. And also as indicated earlier here, what is standardization? A lot of discussions uh, with, with standardization without defining, and it was also mentioned a little bit by, by Bjorn, I think. I mentioned some keywords here, standardized materials, yes. That's a good starting point. But functional requirements with standard performance requirements, yes, could be a good step. Standardized system interfaces, another approach. Documentation, it was also mentioned earlier. What about test requirements, witness points, and so on and so forth. So I think along these lines, I think we need to, to, uh, to, to, pr to, uh, to, to achieve industrialization. We have to work on at least on, 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 on these uh, issues. And um, yeah. Yeah, here is uh, the last uh, one, two minutes left. There are basically, okay, it's a long story. I could, I think I could spend an hour related to this, but I'll just take this uh, in, in, from, from a broad perspective. I mentioned the embargo of Iran and ISO being a non-political organization. This is, has caused um, uh, a problem related to working with technical information in ISO. That was kind of first step. But there are something we call the interim solution out there today, uh, designed or worked uh, with OGP, which sh shall el eliminate this political issue because Iran is not a member of OGP. But then I'm going back to the historical perspective again. ISO and I, I, API in the subsea environment were working together as one family. There was an agreement in the mid or early 90s, but it was not a written agreement. So it means, uh, and, and as a result of that, there are some disagreement related to intellectual properties because most of the uh, subsea um, uh, standards within ISO have API material. And due to this kind of embargo and a lot of things, which this interim solution doesn't work for the subsea equipment, the workgroup six, which I, uh, which I am representing. It works for a lot of other industries, but it doesn't work for workgroup six. So that's basically part of the challenges. And there, I have to stop, I think. So, yes, any questions? Any questions for Jens Hendrik? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bjorn Sjord. I think uh, your previous slide, uh, can you bring that one back? Here. This one? Yes. I think uh, we have to look to what other industries are doing. And uh, what we are seeing here, your list here, if you're going into the maritime industry and how we are building ships, are we actually doing it according to the list that you're having there? So what are we gaining on that? And that is that not only the interface between the buyer and the builder, but also the builder's whole supply chain, not the first link, but also the link down the road. They know they are having predictability what to deliver and also what to document and also what to witness points into. 
So I think uh, what is happening in the maritime industry in uh, Norway, I think it is a very good school for this industry as well to get inspiration from. Yeah, very good point. And I think that in no. respect to quality, we are also discussing what we can achieve from the aircraft industry. I think if you're breaking down the service station, you will be finding that it is the same supplier that is uh, making forgings for a crankshaft to a diesel engine for a boat that, there is, that is producing valve forgings. So therefore, we will also address the same type of suppliers, which are not aware of. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then just I can comment a little bit on that, uh, because for example, we, we, within service controls, for example, we have developed more or less uh, tailor-made uh, systems. But going into, uh, and what's important for service uh, power supply and uh, electronics is, is uh, to use as less energy as possible, because energy causes heat, which is a, p a problem related to uh, service systems, and also infrastructure, increasing infrastructure. Going to electronics developed in the medicine industry, for example, you do not want high power into the human body. So th this kind of synergies uh, across industries, as, as you also indicated, that, that's really what we, what it is a big potential for, for improving quality and performance and, and, and uh, efficiency within the service industry going this way. Yes, okay. Any Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Trum. Uh, Trum. Very interesting, uh, Jens Henrik. I've been following uh, all these issues in the yes, I know. <laughs> EGU and the standardization <laughs> group. Oh. Uh, you said it's below a critical mass in the ISO. Uh, it's difficult to uh, get other European countries to get involved. It's even difficult to get operators and suppliers in Norway to get involved. So Statoil, I guess you're so big that you have your detailed specifications. You you're not necessarily relying on standards. So how shall we address the other ones, both in Norway and the rest of Europe, and involve them? Because I think that's the only way you can be a way of a challenge to API. Yes, I, I agree with you, Trond, and I, in my way forward with a question mark. It's indicating that, yes, we, we, we see the challenges, but we know we have limited resources and, 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 and uh, we have been even when we work together with API as one family, we, had, we, we have worked for many, many years in trying to get more on board than people from Norway. So, so I, I think I understand the challenge and the reason for the question mark is more or less as I indicate you also, how, how are we, yes, we, we need more people aboard, but how are we handling this? How, how are we kind of, what, 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 what are we supposed to do? That's the reason for the question mark. It's, uh, I share your concern related to, to, to standardization. Yes, I do. But we need as an industry to kind of, yes, we have to try as best we can to work hard and see what we, to take the small steps in the right direction. And for example, the standard catalog that we are doing, I think that could be a good step. It could be done, made available for other operators, for example. Why, why shall they develop a new, their standard for the Norwegian continental shelf? And then it's logical to say, okay, why shall we develop our standard for good for Mexico when we can use one from Exxon or others? Things like that. We need to be cl more clever in kind of looking at uh, this challenge in, 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 in kind of a, with, with from a new perspective, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Okay. We have some more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Then, then it's okay. okay. It's one more there. Hello. So my name is Jan Terje Langeun. I'm representing Lotus EMP Norge, which is a new operator on Norwegian shelf, a little Polish company, well, big in Poland, little in Norway. Yeah. And we are looking at this little fuller development with two persons, which fits well, because it's two wells development. But of course, it's obvious that, that there's no way uh, we can develop a set of standards. Yeah. And, and in the old days, you would say, let's go and buy a Christine tree. 
Now, how would this function uh, uh, in real life if we go to, to a bidding process with the contractors and say we would like a copy of the Stato development for a certain field and the contract would say, sorry, those specs belong to Stato and we can't build a tree with Stato specs. We need your specs. How do you think this can work out? Well, I'm, uh, maybe I'm naive here, but uh, if you, if you, what, what we, we, the, the the standard catalog that we are developing now, uh, it, uh, ju just to make it clear uh, here, is FMC will develop their standard, Acer will develop their standard, or or product, uh, one subsidy will uh, develop their product. And GE will develop their product. And it's based on the functional requirements that Statol puts on the table. Look at this as an uh, onion, starting with kind of regulations, functions, requirements, and so on. And the logical next step on, on, the, on, on, on the outer shield here is a product. If you go to, for example, one of the mentions where I say, I want that product. Why do you need over functional requirements, which the product is based on? What's the price? Give me the price for that. Why not? Of course, what you need to have is the design basis for your field, making sure that uh, and check that this product standard is more or less fit for. Uh, and, and as I said, it's a configurable standard, so you need to configure it according to your design basis. But that doesn't need to be too difficult. A couple of good service engineers, I guess, could handle that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Then I think we end this session. Thank you, okay. Jens and Rick. Yeah. Thank you.